Good morning. It's uh, about 11.05 on July 13th, and we're going to go over the Civil War real quick. Uh, I'm not going to go too far into detail with this because it's not a military history class, but I do want to give you enough information that you'll understand what you see on the screen here. Uh, the very first slide here, it's a comparison. Um, a lot of people don't actually do this, and I don't... I wouldn't be surprised if you've never really seen this before, but a lot of people wonder, you know, what did the two sides look like before the war? And... Look, uh, northern states had an advantage over the south in pretty much everything. You had 20.7 million people versus a little over 9 million people. But there in the south, that 9 million people, you have to take into account the slaves. And there were th over 3.5 million slaves. So in the southern states, we're really looking at a free population of five to five and a half million people. When it comes to manufacturing, 111, 110,000 manufacturing sites versus 18 to 20 manufacturing sites. And by manufacturing site, I'm really just meaning a place that makes stuff. Uh, it could be anything. It could be textiles, could be uh, ironworks, you name it. In fact, uh, in the South, there's really only one place that makes ironworks, uh, meaning guns and things like that, when the war starts. Uh, railroads. The North has a pretty robust railroad system. Uh, more than double the mileage of the railroads. And then you also have to take into account in the South, the railroads aren't all the same size. They're not standardized yet. So if you run a railroad, you can uh, basically just build it whatever size you want. But in the North, standardization has come across much sooner so you can send your trains back and forth on different tracks. North has the army, the south has to create an army out of thin air, and the north they can basically outproduce the south no matter what. So a lot of people ask why did the south think they could win completely and totally the American Revolution. Uh, the southern states are thinking if we beat the United Kingdom, if we beat Great Britain, then surely we can beat our next door neighbors. Neither side thought the war was going to last very long. When volunteers were called for, they'd said, hey, we need you to volunteer for three months, maybe six months at the most. There were only, I think, two states, it may have been three, that called for their volunteers to last for an entire year. Uh, there was one person who said that they would drink the blood of all who fell in battle. There was somebody else who said that all the blood that was going to be shed would fit in one cup. And then uh, you just have to look at what both sides want to do. Uh, the North, they want to squeeze the life out of the Confederacy with the Anaconda plan. And then the South, they just want to make the war last as long as they can because they think the North will get tired of fighting. Um, neither of those plans is a short plan, but they didn't think that far ahead. So the volunteers weren't going to be there for the length of this battle and I think anybody who paid attention would have seen that right away. Here's your list of Confederate states uh, and their list that, of dates that they withdrew from the Union and remember several of these are going to leave the Union even before Abraham Lincoln is president. Abraham Lincoln becomes president March 4th, 1861 and by that time, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas are all out of the Union. Three states that stay in the Union are Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. The thing that these three states have in common, they are all slave states that stay in the Union. Maryland is placed under martial law by the government. Uh, basically, the military comes in and takes over. Kentucky... <clears throat> They're trying to bide their time and decide which way they want to go. And Missouri has a miniature civil war because half of Missouri wants to stay part of the Union, half of Missouri wants to become part of the Confederacy. <clears throat> this here is an important slide, and I can guarantee you I'm going to have a question on the final exam about this. And it's how do you actually create these armies? And both the North and the South go through steps. The first one is deciding to fight. Uh, the soldiers are going to volunteer for different reasons. Some want to 
get fame and fortune. Some have never been away from home. Others, it's family tradition, or maybe even they think this is how I become a man, or they have really strong convictions about states' rights or slavery or saving the union, whatever it might be. So the very first thing that has to happen is you have to decide to fight. After that, you have to muster the troops. That's when you actually raise the army. And you would have people going through cities and going through towns, actively recruiting. There would be advertisements placed in newspapers. <clears throat> Maybe an important person in town is going to you know, try and uh, recruit people personally. <clears throat> and even in some places, there are churches that are going to have recruitment drives. Once enough men in a locality are registered to enlist, a company is formed. So that means there is a Douglasville company, a Carrollton company, a LaGrange company. Uh, you're going to serve in this war with all the people from your town or your city or your location. So we have decided to fight. We've mustered the troops. Now we have to outfit the troops. When the war first started, communities would come together and knit socks and things like that. Uh, states would supply the guns and the uniforms. And it's really important to know that the uniforms didn't always match. Today we think of blue being the Union, gray being the Confederacy, but that was not true. Some Union soldiers had gray or, or blue or black. Some Confederate soldiers had red and white and blue and black. And the uniforms were whatever the state and the local community would come up with. Uh, the last part of this is actually training the troops. <clears throat> All the soldiers go to state training camps. They don't go to a national training camp that doesn't exist. So all of the soldiers from Georgia are trained to fight with the people of Georgia. All of the soldiers from New York are, are taught to fight with the soldiers from New York. There's not a lot of interoperability. Um, <clears throat> each state trains their troops differently. And to get uh, troops from Alabama to fight with Mississippi, it was really, really difficult. Same thing for the North. To get Wisconsin troops and Illinois troops to fight together, nearly impossible. And then when the soldiers actually get into battle or get into training, they have a hard time adjusting. People want to go home, and it's their first time being away from home, and and it's just not what they expected it to be. So generally speaking, this is how the armies are going to be created. They decide to fight, then they are mustered into the military, then the troops are going to be outfitted, and then the troops are going to be trained. The very first battle is the Battle of Manassas, also known as the Battle of Bull Run. Uh, this battle happens roughly 25 to 30 miles southwest of where Washington, D.C. is. Today, it is actually part of the D.C. Metro. Uh, I think the D.C. Metro uh, subway actually goes to Manassas. Uh, your two generals are Irvin McDowell for the north and Pierre Gustave Toussaint Beauregard for the south. And it's a pretty even number, 35,000 to 32,000. The battle lasts all day, and surprisingly, the Confederacy wins this battle. The North starts to panic, and the South thinks that the war is over. Very quickly, the war is going to turn to the water. Uh, part of the Anaconda plan is to choke off the Confederacy and shut down all the ports. So by November of 1861, Port Royal, South Carolina is in Union control. Port Royal, South Carolina is what protects Charleston Harbor. Uh, by April of 1862, Fort Pulaski down near Savannah is under Union control, and so Savannah is shut down. And then also in April of 1862, the Union is going to capture New Orleans, so the Confederacy can't really use the... Mississippi River anymore either. Another very important naval development is the battle between the USS Monitor and the Merrimack. Uh, these are the first two ships that are made out of iron. They're called ironclads in fact and they're very low in the water. They are protected with iron sheeting. 
they've got a wood interior, and then they have a rotating gun that can go 360 degrees. Uh, while the battle ends in a draw, it's going to forever change military warfare. And that's because there were some visitors from the United Kingdom, some advisors, if you will, from Great Britain, who watched this battle happen between the Monitor and the Merrimack. And when they see how effective ships made out of iron, or at least coated in iron are, they go back to England, talk to Queen Victoria, and Queen Victoria orders all of the wooden ships to be stopped, and then all ships from that point on to be made out of iron. And the Monitor versus the Merrimack is going to issue in, or usher in, I should say, the modern naval period that we're still in today. 1862 in uh, Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee was the northernest part of the Confederacy. And early in 1862, a, an army from the Confederacy is going to invade Kentucky to try and convince the people of Kentucky to join the Confederacy. It has the opposite effect. The people from Kentucky don't like being invaded and they declare their allegiance to the Union. But what's more important than that is while this Confederate army is in Kentucky, they have left Tennessee almost completely unprotected. And so Ulysses S. Grant uh, is going to organize an attack where they float down the rivers. Uh, they float down the Cumberland River and the Tennessee River, and they surprise the city of Nashville and surround it. Uh, the city of Nashville is going to be surrounded, and uh, it gives up by the end of February of 1862. The Confederate Army is going to be forced to withdraw from Kentucky to try and protect their rear, and by March, the middle of March, I should say, uh, March 17th to be exact, near Savannah, Tennessee, uh, the Union and the Confederate are going to have the first really big battle of the war. Um, the Battle of Shiloh, it's located like 20 or 30 miles north of where Kentucky, not, bleh, it's 20 or 30 miles north of where Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee meet, and it's a huge battlefield. I was there a couple months ago to check it out, and on March 17th, there are more casualties in the ranks than in all previous American wars combined. 23,000 casualties uh, injured and killed on March 17th of 1862. That is more than all the wars America had participated in prior, put together. Virginia in 1862, this is going to be important because it's where the Confederate capital is. Uh, if you weren't rear, aware, the Confederate capital is in Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia and Washington, D.C. were less than 100 miles apart from each other. Uh, the Union, they're going to go from Fort Monroe, which is near what is today Norfolk, Newport News, Virginia, and they're going to try and march to the west and take over Richmond. Uh, the Confederates know that this is going to happen, and both sides are very well armed. Uh, the Union General George C. McClellan has over 100,000 men, where the Confederates, led by Joseph E. Johnston, have about 70 to 80,000 men. Um, this is going to be a series of battles that's a month long. It goes from the end of May to the end of June of 1862. And the Confederates stopped the Union Army. George C. McClellan is forced to retreat, but Joseph E. Johnston is injured and is forced to give up his command. And that is actually how Robert E. Lee becomes the, uh, the primary leader for the Confederate Army. All total in that month of fighting, Virginia, within Virginia, there are 35,000 casualties. So these are large numbers of soldiers who are gonna be injured and killed. When you put everything together, the fall of 1862 is the high point of the Confederacy. If the Confederacy was going to win world, uh, the war, uh, this is their chance to show the world. Um, Robert E. Lee is going to launch an invasion of Maryland. Um, 
Braxton Bragg is going to in, launch an invasion of Kentucky. And it was all to try and get outside help. Um, if the Confederacy could show the world that they have a chance to win, the Confederacy thought that others would come and try and help them. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen. The invasion of Maryland does not work. Maryland doesn't join the Confederacy. France and Britain, they're not swayed, and they don't come to the aid of the Confederacy. And Kentucky, uh, Braxton Bragg, his invasion fails as well, and so he's not able to get the Union forces to leave the state of Tennessee. Some political developments that you need to know. Uh, first of all, uh, people are growing unhappy with economics. Uh, the Union is going to pass the Legal Tender Act, which makes dollar bills legal. The Confederacy is going to have to create their economy from scratch, and they start printing uh, paper money, and then it's runaway inflation because their paper money is not backed by anything, and nobody will accept their paper money. Uh, because of that, the South is going to have a bunch of riots. They're going to have wage riots, food riots, you name it. Uh, there are even going to be like... Uh, people who riot against the idea of being conscripted and forced to serve in the military. On the diplomatic front, uh, as I kind of alluded to a, a couple slides ago, the Confederates, they want to get European recognition, and they think that if the European countries will recognize them, that they can win. And there's one thing the Confederacy really had that they thought Europe wanted, and that was cotton. So... At the start of the war, the Confederacy stops selling cotton to Europe, thinking that you know, it will cause a great demand. The problem is, though, in the 1850s, so much cotton was sent to Europe that they just had an excess of it. And when the Confederacy stopped selling cotton to Europe, Europe's just like, well, we have plenty of it in storage. We don't need it. And when Europe finally did need more cotton, they had alternate sources to be found in both India and Egypt. When this cotton diplomacy fails, uh, the Confederacy is going to say, well, we want to buy guns and weapons from you, but we can't because the Union's blocking our, our movements. And the European countries say, you know what? We're selling enough to the Union. We don't need your fake monopoly money. The time has come where um, all of the Volunteers are going home, and a lot of people were not voluntarily re-enlisting. So both the North and the South passed conscription acts requiring compulsory participation in the war. Uh, one big difference between the Confederacy and the Union, though, in the Union, if you were wealthy enough, you could pay to have somebody else take your place in fighting. There are anti-war movements in both the North and the South. In the North, the Copperhead movement begins where they want to stop the war. And um, George C. McClellan, who was the, the one who fought the, the battles in Virginia for the Union, he's actually fired by Abraham Lincoln from being the general. And he starts a political career and runs for president against Abraham Lincoln on an anti-war campaign. So in many ways, George C. McClellan is the head of the Copperhead movement. But also, uh, another very good example of this Copperhead movement to end the war is Clement Vlandigham of Ohio. He was a U.S. representative serving in Congress from Ohio, and he decides to run for the governorship of Ohio. And one of the things he says he's going to do is bring all of the troops from Ohio home. Volandigam has a real chance of winning. So Abraham Lincoln orders uh, Ambrose Burnside, who is a general, uh, to arrest Clement Volandigam and accuse him basically of treason. Um, Burnside arrests Volandigam and Volandigam is put on trial. He's sent to the South because the Union thinks he's a Confederate sympathizer, which he was not. And the Confederacy is going to end up sending him to Canada. Um, in the Confederacy, there's a peace movement that breaks out in Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia, and even Alabama. And uh, troops are going to be riot, rose, risen, whatever you want to call it, in the South to go and fight for the North. So there are going to be Tennessee troops, Georgia troops, Mississippi troops, and North Carolina troops who fight for the Union in the Confederacy. 
Southern women are very much not happy because the military has told them that they would be protected and they're not. Um, some of the women are expected to sacrifice for the men and give clothing and equipment to the men and, and support the men. And um, they don't get any of this, st any of the protections that they're guaranteed in exchange for doing that. Uh, so women are actually going to stop supporting the war and women are going to uh, help prisoners of war escape and women are going to write to the men encouraging them to come home and, and give up. So southern women are going to actively work against the war when the war starts to go wrong. Now we come to a big issue, the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, you've probably been taught your entire life that the Emancipation Proclamation ended slavery and abolished slavery. Um, but the honest truth is it did not. By January 1st, 1863, Abraham Lincoln was not having a really good time of convincing people to continue the war. These anti-war movements have broken out and... Um, the Union hasn't done very well with, with the fight. So on January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation is going to be issued, and that's where the war is going to change from a war to save the Union to a war to end slavery. And this is a political movement by Abraham Lincoln. Now, what the Emancipation Proclamation actually does is it frees the states that are in free slaves from areas that are under active rebellion, meaning that Lincoln is freeing the slaves in the Confederate states. Uh, it's completely unforceable because Lincoln has no say at this time over the Confederate states, and the slave owners who live in the Confederate states, they're not going to free their slaves. And you can really tell this because when you read the Emancipation Proclamation, there are a lot of places that are excluded from this taking over. Uh, parts of Louisiana, parts of Alabama, parts of Mississippi. It specifically says the Emancipation Proclamation does not apply to. And the reason it doesn't apply there, those are places that the American army has already taken over. So Lincoln's not ending slavery in any territory controlled by the Union, only in territory controlled by the Confederacy. So no, the Emancipation Proclamation, it does not end slavery, but it's a very good political tool. Now, what happens late in the Civil War? Uh, almost at the same time, there are two big battles that happen, one in Vicksburg, one in Gettysburg. In Vicksburg, Mississippi, July 4th, 1863, the city of Vicksburg is going to surrender to the Union Army. It's been surrounded for weeks. And that is the last river crossing that was under Confederate control. The Confederacy's cut in two. All of the horses and everything that they were getting from Arkansas and Texas and even Arizona, uh, they can't get anymore. Uh, why is that so important? Because if there was one advantage the Confederacy had, it was with their horse-mounted soldiers. The Confederate cavalry was better than the American cavalry. Well, not anymore because they don't have horses to replenish the horses that are lost in battle. In Pennsylvania, we have the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, Robert E. Lee is marching to Gettysburg because there are some clothing, specifically shoe factories there, and also to try and draw out the Union Army and beat them on the battlefield. And this is, ends up being a three-day battle that is a disaster for the Confederates. Uh, day one of the battle is a Confederate victory, but day two, there's bad intelligence gathered by Robert E. Lee. He doesn't know that the Union Army has reinforced itself. And then on the third day, one of Robert E. Lee's subordinate generals uh, decides to make up his own plan and doesn't follow Robert E. Lee's plan. And then another general shows up to the battlefield late. And by then, it's, it's over. And Robert E. Lee is forced to order a retreat from the battlefield. <clears throat> Closer to home, we have the Atlanta campaign. And uh, General William T. Sherman, who's very famous around these parts, is going to march from Chattanooga to Atlanta, fighting the entire time with the Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston, who has uh, recovered from his injuries. 
Uh, Sherman is going to leave Chattanooga with about 100,000 men, while Johnston has 60,000 men to stop him. And they fight along the railroad that goes between Chattanooga and Atlanta. Where is that railroad? Uh, if you've ever driven Interstate 75 between the two cities, the railroad is just off to the, to the side. So you have a series of battles going from Chattanooga all the way to the northern suburbs of Atlanta. That's why we have the Battle of East Ridge, uh, Rocky Face, Dalton, Resaca, Kennesaw Mountain, Ringgold. All of those places are during the Atlanta campaign. Uh, here in Atlanta, you've got a, a battle that happens in Whitesburg, a battle that happens in, in Noonan, Peachtree Creek, the northern suburbs, you name it. Once Sherman's army gets to northern Cobb County or so, um, Joseph E. Johnston is replaced by a guy named John Bell Hood. And in one week of fighting, John Bell Hood loses more men than Johnston had lost in uh, over three months. Johnston is very quickly reinstated and John Bell Hood is fired. Um, when it comes to Atlanta itself, um, the Confederate government in Atlanta burns down anything of value. Uh, they set fire to cotton and munitions and everything else. And when the Union comes in, they add to it, and then they also tear up the railroads. Once the Atlanta campaign is over, then we have Sherman's march to the sea. Uh, 60,000 men are going to spread out and march from Atlanta to Savannah. Uh, they leave in late, well, actually mid-November, and then they arrive in late December down in Savannah. That is almost a 300-mile march. And... Um, they live off the land. Um, there are not very many supplies brought with William Sherman's army. They're supposed to bargain and buy from the locals, but in many cases they just take and snatch instead. And that's part of what makes Sherman's March to the Sea so controversial, is they end up stealing from the locals. Now, how does the war end? Um, up in Virginia, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant, uh, they are fighting each other. They're marching back and forth through Virginia. And uh, Robert E. Lee is eventually going to be surrounded near a place called Appomattox Courthouse. Uh, Lee is forced to give up the capital city of Richmond, uh, the city of Petersburg, which is the <clears throat> southern suburb of Richmond, had been under siege for almost six months and Petersburg and Richmond just couldn't hold out anymore. So Lee has to withdraw in late March, early April from the capital city. Uh, the surrounding happens in early April um, and Lee asks for terms of surrender on April 8th and then on April 9th Lee and Grant actually meet and the surrender is signed. That's not actually supposed to end the war. It's just Robert E. Lee had the largest surviving army. Uh, Joseph E. Johnston actually won't surrender until April 26, and he does that in uh, North Carolina. And to make it even more confusing and interesting, there is a battle in Columbus, Georgia, like the day after uh, Johnston's surrender, and then the final, the final Confederate troops are going to surrender in September or in October. It's a Confederate warship that surrenders in Liverpool, England. John Wilkes Booth, he is going to assassinate Lincoln on April 14th, 1865. Lincoln never actually lives to see the end of the war. And um, Lincoln is shot by John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth is a Confederate sympathizer. He's also a, a stage actor and he kills Lincoln thinking that that would encourage the South to continue fighting. But in reality, uh, once Lee surrenders, then there's no restarting this war. All right, uh, less than 30 minutes. That's the main points of the Civil War. There's a lot more. There are schools that offer entire years worth of classes on just the Civil War alone. But I wanted to give you something that was a little bit short so you understood a little bit better what you're reading and what you're seeing and what might be on the test. All right, as always, any questions, comments, concerns, send me an email. 
and I will answer those as quick as I can for you. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.